Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today I want to go over some of my takeaways and lessons learned and sort of after-action report on Moons Out, Goons Out 2024. This was our nighttime rifle match uh, held in West Virginia last weekend with the essential support of the One Shepherd Leadership Institute, a better cadre of squad leaders and range officers you could not find for a night rifle match. The guys were awesome, and they made the match run super smoothly. We had a total of 114 participants. We had eight stages, uh, 240 second or four minute par times on each stage. We ran the staff match first. We ran the staff match all eight stages in one night. I shot that with a high point carbine with a B.E. Myers Maul on it. We'll touch on that in a moment, why on earth I made that choice. And then we had the main match the next two nights. Those were four stages per night. I shot that with a Q boombox and an AGM Clarion thermal scope. Now I have a honey badger here for reference because the boombox was actually a prototype from Q uh, that was on loan and I gave it back to them at the very end of the match. So I don't actually have it here to show you to recap. But essentially it is a honey badger in 8.6 blackout. So it's the slightly scaled up version of the Honey Badger. Now what was my thought process on this? First off, by the way, I will be posting, in the next few days I'll be posting my complete full stage runs for both of these guns, but I figured you might like a little bit of a condensed uh, overview instead of watching about an hour of continuous range footage. So what on earth is the deal with a high point? Well, my thought process was like this. For a night match, what's really important is being able to identify and designate a target. Be able to see it and then aim at it. And the rifle itself doesn't really matter. Now, in a way, like, that stands true, but I took it a bit too far. So yes, the most important thing is being able to hit the target, because as we'll see with my run with the boombox, when I couldn't see the target, it didn't matter how nice the rifle was, you can't fire, you can't hit, so you're screwed. However, the rifle does matter more than I led myself to believe. So thought was like a high point carbine, nine millimeter parabellum. Um, it is powerful enough to knock down the popper targets. It meets the minimum requirements for the match, which was nine millimeter parabellum. Uh, it's semi-automatic, which is like, that's a major step up. Manually operated guns are a huge detriment, but this is semi-auto. It is accurate enough to hit a silhouette or even a partial size silhouette at 100 yards, so it's accurate enough for the match, it's semi-auto, it's powerful enough, like it meets all of the match criteria. And what I can do is, first off, stick a suppressor on it. That's a carbon fiber, or a carbon research, fully carbon fiber 9mm can. It weighs like 7 ounces. I thought it was a perfect fit, just direct threaded onto the barrel. And then I'll get the best possible laser designator and illuminator that there is on the civilian market. And that would be the B.E. Myers Mall, really without much argument. Now, uh, B.E. Myers loaned me this mall, and they actually loaned me a full power military one, although I never actually put it into full power mode in the match, and really had no need to, didn't have any desire to. I didn't handicap myself at all sticking with the civilian power options. And the mall, by the way, the military and the civilian malls are absolutely the same, the only difference being the high power mode which is available on the military one, which is not available on the civilian one. One of my real takeaways here is that the controls are also a huge part. Um, being able to control whether I'm on low or medium power and whether I'm using the laser or the laser and the illuminator together, that was actually pretty important. And there are a lot of tape switch setups uh, you know, augmented button setups that just don't work very well here. In fact, you can see that I put a tape switch on this, which was connected to the button that activates both the light and the laser together. But by the end of the match, frankly, this button got really stiff when it got cold out. There were times when I didn't want both features, I only wanted the laser, and so I ended up often using the buttons on the mall, even though the high point carbine doesn't really let me mount this mall far enough, as far forward as I would generally want it to be. So I had a great time identifying targets. I essentially had no problem ever identifying targets, but 
the ergonomics of the high point did really handicap me. The biggest thing were the 10 round magazines. So we had stages that required just shy of 40 rounds, 40 hits. You add in misses. Well, I took six magazines with me, six 10 round mags. I had a couple of 20 round red ball magazines. They just didn't work reliably with 147 grain ammo. And so I left them at home. I went with six 10 round mags. And there were a couple stages where I had to use all six mags. It is a slow reload. I had a lot of issues confirming whether the magazine was fully seated. If you leave the bolt closed, like if you're doing a proactive reload and the bolt's closed and the magazine's full, it takes a lot of pressure to fully seat the mag in a high point. Um, in the dark, it's a little difficult to always tell. Is it fully seated? And then you, if it's not, the, like the, the mag will stay in the pistol grip, but it's not high enough to chamber around, so you'll rack around. You can't really visually check it because of the, the focal differences on nods. You don't want to zoom your nods in to look at the bolt to make sure it's chambered. You just want to assume it's chambered. So instead you get a click instead of a bang and then you have to diagnose and fix the problem. That really hindered me. That was the biggest thing that led to me getting penalties on the stages that I ran with the high point. So by the way, for a little bit of context here, if you're not familiar with it, this is a brutality style match. So the penalty for everything is 60 seconds. and we didn't have any no-shoot targets in this match, so essentially the penalty were targets that you ran out of time and weren't able to engage. So if you hit 240 seconds and you hadn't finished the stage, every target you hadn't gotten to, that's a one minute penalty. And with the high point, I had 35 of those wonderful things. And they pretty much all came from, well, uh, the long range stage, the uh, obstacle course, the oh no, not again course, um, I was not particularly effective. I was very slow on that. Um, and that's a me thing rather than a gun thing primarily, but it wasn't helped by the fact that I had to reload like four times along the course of that stage. Like it really was the reloads. Had I gone with a slightly better rifle, if I were going to do this over again next year, instead of a high point carbine, I would have picked something like a totally budget $500 AR, like old school PSA AR-15 put together from random parts as cheaply as possible. Just make sure it's good enough that it cycles, because as long as the gun's reliable, you take this standard and then you add a 30 round magazine to it, and then I really think you are in a position where the gun kind of doesn't matter. The difference between a totally cheap bargain bin AR, as long as it works reliably, uh, and a $5,000 super fancy AR, there is none for this match. It would be the mall that would make all the difference, and the mall is a stupidly expensive uh, IR laser, it's like $3,800, significantly more than anything else in its class, but it really does deliver. Uh, having seen, having been to this night match twice in a row now, I've seen a lot of different night vision setups, a lot, well, a lot of different IR laser illuminator setups, and the mall is totally the best of them. I just over, I didn't fully anticipate how, how problematic the high point carbine would be. So that's that one. Now, the plan was to then run a super cool, like top of the line, everything great setup for my alter for my second run, my alternative run. And to do that, like the Q boombox was an obvious choice for me. I've been really excited about this rifle ever since I first heard about it. The Honey Badger is cool, but the idea of a semi-automatic 8.6 blackout is really appealing. And as I mentioned at the beginning, they're not in production yet. They've only made something like 10, 12 at this point. They're still refining them. There's still some tweaks that are being made, some changes before they actually get into production. So it's not a gun that I actually had a lot of time to practice on. It's not a gun I got to keep after the match, um, even for filming. Um, but I thought, what better to put on top of it than a really good thermal scope? And I have an AGM Clarion on loan for this, which is a really good thermal scope. It's like a $6,000 scope. I mean, you put all that package together, it's like $10,000 worth of gun. It's got to be great, right? Well, no. And that came as a bit of a surprise to me. So last year I ran an AGM Rattler, which is the slightly smaller uh, high-end AGM thermal scope, and it worked fantastically well for me. This year I had a lot more problems with targets, steel targets, that were really hard to distinguish, to see at night. Um, last year it wasn't so much of a problem, and it seemed like the, the Rattler had plenty, uh, you know, plenty of contrast in it to be able to pick up targets and see them, even though they were not heated targets. The Clarion did not, and I don't really think it's the scope, because the technology in the two scopes is the same. I think 
I actually probably got lucky last year with environmental conditions and backdrops, you know, the, the distance between targets and backstops. Uh, mo many of the targets, I'm not going to say most, probably about half of the targets were still very easily distinguishable with the clarion. But there were a couple places where they weren't. So we had a series of falling poppers that you had to shoot from the back of a moving Humvee. I got one of those. I should have been able to clean that. Um, like That was one of my big problems last year. As I shot this stage, I could see the poppers well with the thermal, but I was shooting a bolt-action gun last year, and I didn't. I think I managed to get one or zero of them last year. That was a, a problem. Um, the biggest single thing for me was actually on our shoot house stage, where we, you come out the back of the shoot house and you have to shoot at a hundred yard target out in the woods, and I just simply straight up could not find it. Now looking at the thermal scope footage after the fact, I was able to spot it, but man it is a really hard to see target. Um, it was only the like the top half of the head that was actually visible with the geometric square lines of the head. So even looking at the footage I'm like, yeah, boy, I wish I'd been able to spot it, but it's not like I just gave up too early on that. So that alone, like I had 36 total penalties with the, the, the boombox and, and thermal, nine of them. So a full quarter of the penalties I had in the match came from that one target that I couldn't see. So. In effect, it, it's interesting to me, one of the things when you compare matches to real life shooting in a military sort of context, usually the takeaway is, well the match is easier. When there's differences the match is easy and real, shoot, real world shooting is harder. Thermal is the inverse. It's a very, I think it's a very unusual instance of the match is the hard one and real life would be a lot easier. Because in the match you're shooting at cold steel targets, which kind of defeats the purpose of thermal. Like They don't light up. A, an actual live person or animal literally shows up like a bright glowing thing in a thermal scope, but not so much when it's cold steel targets. So it did surprise me this year that we had I had as much trouble as I did seeing targets. So overall when I look at the two scores side by side I was 78th out of 114. Hooray! Such great performance. With the high point I was 81st with the boombox. And the difference is essentially, well, 30, uh, what was it, 35 penalties to 36 penalties. Actually pretty close in there, but um, with the high point run my problems came from weapon manipulation primarily when it wasn't shooting skill, because definitely there were some stages like the, the obstacle course where I just wasn't doing very well. Frankly I didn't do very well with it with the, the boombox on that stage either. But it was largely weapon malfunction or weapon manipulation that gave me trouble with this, and it was target designation and identification that gave me trouble with the thermal, which is something I really wasn't expecting. So if I was going to go back and wanted to do it properly, like I would have upped this a little bit to a really cheap AR or similar rifle, um, and I would have swapped out the thermal for either a mall, or probably best case scenario would be to have a thermal scope with a laser designator. So I specifically wanted to be in passive division with the boombox, which is no IR emissions at all, uh, which is hard. Like that's really the hard mode. May, less, I think we had 13 out of 114 competitors shooting passive mode in the match. So virtually everyone was in active mode. And Passive's hard. Like uh, being able to designate targets, to see targets when you can't actually shine any light out there in the dark is tricky. And thermal is potentially a very good way to do it, but it's got its limitations in shooting matches. So uh, next year it'd be fun to actually have a production boombox. Hopefully they, I think they should be out by then. And it'd be really fun to go active division with one of those, with something like an E-Attack, or maybe even a smaller thermal scope coupled with a mall. Uh, also worth pointing out the helmet. I was wearing, I didn't have a soft cap for night vision, I just had a helmet as one typically sees with night vision goggles, and that's easier with some of the, the well it's super easy with a laser where you don't have to get your head behind it. Um, thermal scopes have very short eye boxes, so getting the nods up out of the way, getting the helmet in position behind a thermal scope can be pretty tricky. So again, lesson learned for next year, I'm going to look for a soft cap if I'm going to be running a thermal scope. Anything I have to get my eye up really close behind, uh, rather than having a helmet bonking into my, uh, into my scope next year, I'm going to go for a, a soft cap to keep it out of the way. 
Um, a few other sort of random takeaways. It was cold, it was rainy. Um, we had one, rain one night, we had one night, the coldest night got down to like 27 degrees. That's like three, two or three below in Celsius. I was frankly totally comfy warm the whole time, and it was thanks to wearing Varastaleka layered merino wool kit primarily. So, um, like I live in Arizona, I don't have that much experience getting out there in really cold weather, but I coupled up Leica uh, level one, level two long underwear, and then their loft jacket and pants, and then the wool shell on top, and then winter camo on top of that uh, for my run with the boombox. I thought, hey, winter camo is cool, well, why not use it here? And it should be a bit white on camera and help me show up a little bit better, make the video a little bit better. Uh, it also happens to be waterproof and windproof, which was a fantastic thing when it started raining and getting windy on us. Uh, it did make me look a bit like the, uh, the Michelin Man, uh, a little baggy, a little bulky, but that stuff is really cool and worked really well. Um, big thanks to all of the other sponsors that made it possible. Uh, B.E. Myers was one, Q was one, AGM was one. They all sent loaner kit for me to use in the match. Uh, also a Refuge Medical, also T-Rex Arms, also of course our main match sponsor, TNVC Tactical Night Vision Company. If you need any night vision stuff, definitely check them out. They supply basically everything that you might need. So. Those are my overviews. That is why Ian took a high point carbine to a nighttime rifle match. Would I do it again? No, not so much. Uh, reasonable concept. Hypothesis was the rifle doesn't matter. Conclusion is actually no, the rifle does matter. And so does the optic. So I have, as I said, my two full state, full match videos coming uh, in the next couple of days. Also, I will include a link, uh, links in the description text below to all of the other match videos that other people have posted. Uh, I'll be adding to those as things come out. Uh, at the time of this filming, Brass Facts has a video out. I know Hop uh, has one coming. There's a short one from Kit Badger. I think there's a longer one from Kit Badger probably in the works as well, and some others. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that look. If you're interested in this sort of thing, we are absolutely doing the match again next year. Keep an eye out for it. It was a really good time, despite being miserable at times, cold, windy, wet, and tired, but lots of fun for everyone involved. Thanks for watching.